And, uh, yeah, welcome everybody to the online seminar today. It is my great honor to introduce Steve Wright, a speaker today. So Steve Wright is uh, one of the most famous optimizers in particular with a huge expert expertise in numerical optimization. So I would say the, the probably the most famous thing what he did was uh, the book he wrote yeah, with, with Horst Nosedal. So uh, I learned a lot from, from this book. And uh, of course, uh, yeah, Steve did uh, many things after that and that's before. So I just want uh, to mention that uh, he's science fellow and uh, yeah, he, is, uh, he was uh, uh, editor in chief of uh, the flagship journal, Science Optimization. So Steve, so you will talk today right. about second order methods yeah, for non-optimization. The stage is yours. Thank okay, you for thank you. Our invitation. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, uh, Radu, and I really appreciate the the chance to speak in this series. It's been a fantastic series and a lot of fun. Um, so I wanted to start off uh, giving a little bit of introduction and motivation for this topic of complexity in, in continuous optimization, and then I wanted to say something about some of the things that my group has been doing um, with a variety of collaborators. First of all, in unconstrained optimization, there's three topics there, align search, trust region, and strict saddle uh, algorithms. Secondly, for bound constrained optimization, we have a log barrier method and a projected Newton CG. And finally, some recent work on um, equality constrained nonlinear optimization. So this is joint work with a number of uh, collaborators, uh, Clément Loyer, who is a postdoc here, he's now in Paris, Michael O'Neill, who just graduated and he's just transitioned to Lehigh. Um, UAG, who's a postdoc here at Wisconsin, and Frank and Frank Curtis, Daniel Robinson, both at Lehigh, collaborators at Lehigh. So uh, what, is, what do I mean by complexity and optimization? Well, what it's about is finding bounds on the amount of computation for an algorithm or for problems in a certain class, like LP, QP, convex, nonlinear, whatever. Um, so the first question is, how do you measure computation? And there are different ways to do that. One is just to count up the number of iterations, and you could be talking about number of outer iterations or the total number of inner iterations in a problem. And the second way to measure things is the so-called oracle complexity, which I'll say a little bit more about. And essentially this is how many queries are made uh, to the function uh, or to, to the problem for information about the problem, like things like uh, queries for function values at a particular point or gradient or Hessian values at a particular point. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking just about upper bounds on uh, computational requirements, not lower bounds. Lower bounds is a whole different topic. So, uh, you know, a seminal document in, uh, that got people thinking about complexity was this book of Nemirovsky and Yudin, which was published in English in uh, 1983. Um, and they identified uh, three ingredients. One is that, uh, you know, in analyzing complexity, first of all, you have to come up with a class of problems that you're going to be talking about. The second thing is you're going to have to define uh, what you mean by oracles. That is exactly what sort of uh, information about the problem is the algorithm allowed to ask for. And typically this is something like a function value and or a gradient value and maybe a second order Hessian value. And the third thing is you need to, you need some way of defining the inaccuracy in the solution. So given some epsilon, some measure of relative error, what do you, what does it mean for a solution to be, to be epsilon accurate? that really comes into things because typically you end up defining the complexity as defining the measure of work in terms of this epsilon. So also in this book, they talk about different kinds of complexity, iteration complexity I mentioned, uh, elementary operation type complexity, and also they mentioned memory. They call iterations laboriousness. I think that might've been an artifact of the translation into English, but uh, uh, that term isn't widely used now, I would say. And they considered a bunch of uh, mostly convex problems. They sort of throw out their hands early on and say, look, finding the global minimum of a non-convex function is just going to be exponential in the dimension. And uh, so we're not going to talk about that anymore. And they focused mostly on these convex problem classes. And, you know, the book's very encyclopedic. It goes into tremendous detail about uh, those, those uh, different uh, areas. So um, let me say a little bit more about um, complexity in nonlinear optimization. Most of you would know about how uh, 
the, the history of complexity in linear programming, how the simplex is known to be uh, not polynomial, but uh, in general, but the um, uh, interior point methods um, uh, are polynomial. And so there's a lot of work done on that in the 80s and 90s. Um, there was also work, of course, dating to Nestro's famous 1983 paper about the complexity of a general smooth convex uh, minimizer or strongly convex also. Uh, Nestro's 1983 paper on accelerated gradient. And then there's also a, a lot of classical work on um, analyzing st stochastic gradient or subgradient and stochastic subgradient methods and, and finding convergence rates for algorithms in that class. Um, so I'd say uh, recently there's been a lot more focus on not on finding uh, on non-convex problems, not on finding global minima because that's you know clearly too hard in general, but on finding points that satisfy approximately a second order necessary conditions or maybe even higher order instead of global solutions. And this coincides with this discovery in machine learning that there are actually a lot of interesting problems that uh, uh, where the, uh, if you find a point that satisfies second order conditions, you've basically found a global solution or something that's as good as a global solution. And another feature of some problems in, in machine learning is another nice feature is that um, saddle points, uh, in some cases, saddle points are always strict. That is, if you come across a point with a zero gradient, that's a saddle point, um, the directions of negative curvature have, uh, you know, a well-defined negative curvature. It's not kind of a wishy-washy negative curvature direction. So these nice features sort of indicate that second order necessary points are actually good things to know. They might be good enough for solving these non-convex problems. And so that's another motivation to look for points like that. So there's been a lot of work in this area in the last, uh, I'd say maybe uh, 10 years at the outside, but uh, mostly less than that. I just want to sort of say what the philosophy that we've approached it with, that's myself and my collaborators, we, we recognize that there's a, a rich collection of practical algorithms out there for nonlinear, non-convex optimization, unconstrained and constrained. Um, we recognize that the typical convergence theory, if you look in, for example, my book with uh, Jorge, um, we prove things like, you know, what's the rate of local convergence once you get into the neighborhood of a solution, we prove things like accumulation points of the sequence generated by the algorithm are stationary or maybe satisfy second order necessary conditions. We don't really talk much about the rates, but these are good algorithms. They're tried and true. People use them a lot in practice. And so what we've asked is, can we tweak these algorithms in certain ways, just you know, enhance them, add some bells and whistles so that they have good uh, global complexity properties without sacrificing the, the, the practical aspects of them, without compromising the, the practicality. So we've sort of worked up from practical algorithms and tried to turn them into algorithms that also have good complexity rather than you know, the other way around, rather than starting from an algorithm that's strictly theoretically valid and then trying to make it work in practice. Also, we, we are, I'm, I'm gonna emphasize a lot this business of finding approximate second order points, a lot of people uh, do work on just finding approximate first order points. Um, and, and we've done that too, but, but uh, I want to emphasize in this talk, second order points. And also um, we're not going to necessarily require explicit knowledge of the Hessian. Um, and the, the reason is that all of the algorithms I'll describe, they, they only access the Hessian by forming uh, products of the Hessian with a random vector. So in other words, the, the, one of the basic operations is that you supply a vector D and you need an oracle to tell you what is the Hessian at the current point times that vector D. And you can actually get that with computational differentiation. So if you've got a code that evaluates the gradient, obviously you can evaluate the gradient transpose with any vector D, and then you can apply computational differentiation to that and get uh, the Hessian times D. So you don't, even though these are second order methods, they don't actually need the Hessian necessarily. So that's my introduction. So, so let me dive into uh, unconstrained optimization. So um, I'm gonna be talking about smooth problems here and I'm gonna be looking for points that approximately satisfy these second order conditions. Um, one sort of constant in all this analysis is I'm gonna assume that the function that we're working with, although it's non-convex, there's some sort of a lower bound, uh, F low. Uh, of course, if that's not true, your algorithms usually, if you've got a decent algorithm, quite often it'll run off to minus infinity. 
um, and that'll be pretty obvious, but uh, so we'll sort of exclude that case and just assume we've got a lower bound. And also I'm assuming significant smoothness of this algorithm. So I'll assume that both the gradient and the Hessian uh, satisfy this Lipschitz continuity condition. Now, right away from these conditions here, you can immediately write down these two upper bounds on the value of F at any point X plus P. You can get a quadratic upper bound using the Lipschitz constant for the gradient and a cubic upper bound using the Lipschitz constant for the Hessian. And these turn out to be very useful in designing and, and analyzing these methods. So when I talk about approximate second order points, this is, I mentioned epsilon earlier on when I was talking about Nemirovsky and Newton. Epsilon sort of quantifying the amount of, uh, you know, error you're prepared to tolerate in finding these points. So I'm going to be looking for points where the norm of the gradient is below epsilon g and the Hessian uh, at, at x is, uh, has all its eigenvalues bigger than minus epsilon h, where they're two small tolerances. I'm going to be talking about iteration complexities for finding points like this. How many iterations does the algorithm take? And I'll also talk about operation complexities. And by that, I'm going to define the fundamental operations to be either evaluating a gradient or evaluating a Hessian vector product. And if you believe, uh, you know, the, the rules of computational differentiation, the cost of getting a Hessian vector product is some small multiple of three or four of the cost of getting a gradient. So it's not, the, the cost of these two things is not massively different. Okay, so let me start off with just describing a very, very simple method that for which you can prove a complexity result and give you, give you a little bit of a flavor of how this sort of analysis works. So I'm gonna describe a method that finds an approximate second order point satisfying the conditions on the previous slide there in order of this many iterations epsilon g to the minus two, epsilon h to the minus three. And the algorithm is very simple. At first of all, at every iterate xk, it looks at the gradient. And if the gradient is bigger than epsilon g, it takes a short steepest descent step with step length one over lg. And you can prove using that quadratic upper bound from a couple of slides ago, this one here, you can prove that that's guaranteed to give an improvement in the function. And in fact, it's guaranteed to decrease f by at least this amount, order of epsilon g squared. Okay, so that's what you do if the gradient's big. If the gradient's small, you look at the Hessian. And if the Hessian has an eigenvalue less than minus epsilon h, you look for a direction dk of negative curvature. That is an eigenvector corresponding to that minimum eigenvalue. And then you take a step of this length along that direction, and you can prove using the cubic upper bound from that slide there that you get at least this much improvement in the function, order of epsilon h cubed. So if you put those two things together, if the two uh, conditions for approximate second order necessary are not satisfied, you can show that um, you get the min of these two quantities, at least the min of these two quantities improvement in the function. And if you compare that to the, the, the function value at the starting point, f of x zero, and the lower bound, Combine that, that gap with the fact that you're at least making a certain amount of improvement, just divide one of those quantities by the other, you can come up with a bound in the number of iterations, and it's that many. Order epsilon g to the minus two, epsilon h to the minus three. Now, you might object that, well, in order to implement this algorithm, you need to know the eigenvalues of the Hessian. You know, fair enough, that's a potentially expensive operation. But it turns out you don't really need to know the most negative eigenvalue. All you need to know is an eigenvalue that's less than, or you need to know a, a direction along which the curvature is less than or equal to minus one half epsilon h. That's good enough to get this epsilon h cubed decrease. And it turns out you can use a random, randomized Lanchos process, uh, each iteration of which just requires a Hessian vector product. And that will give you a vector of this, uh, uh, with this property in order of epsilon h to the minus one half iterations. So um, you don't need to iterate, you know, to find all the uh, eigenvalues exactly. You can find one that will give you what you need in that many operations. So the operation complexity for the algorithm, you get that by just multiplying this iteration complexity by this workload, which is the most expensive kind of operation that you'll, that you'll take. So the operation complexity would be order uh, max of epsilon, 
uh, g to the minus 2, epsilon h to the minus 7 over 2 for this very simple method. So just a quick review on uh, you know, how things have developed for um, unconstrained second order methods. There's a very important paper of Nesterov and Polyak from, from 2006, where they essentially worked off that cubic upper bound. And at each iteration, they look to find the minimizer of this, this upper bound, where there's some estimate is made of the Lipschitz constant for the Hessian. And um, the steps basically are the P's that minimize this cubic and you step in those directions and they prove a, a, a complexity which is better than the one for that simple method that I showed you. Actually, I, uh, this idea of cubic regularization appeared very early on in a, a paper of Grievenk in 1981 when he was at Cambridge. Uh, he told me about it in 1986. Um, he didn't have a complexity analysis, but he certainly had this idea. Um, so other people picked up on the Nestor Polyak paper um, and there was a, a, a burst of uh, a work on that by several authors that I'm mentioning here. Um, I particularly mentioned the work of uh, Carter School and Twan who jumped on this by already in 2007, 2008 uh, and then have writ written many papers on this over the years. And also they've looked at higher order uh, type methods um, trying to find uh, points that are nearly satisfy higher order necessary conditions, not just second order. Um, and so these papers then mostly focus on iteration complexity. They don't take into account necessarily the cost of solving this sub problem. Um, so people that uh, just in the last four years or so, people have put out papers where they focus on the operation complexity. They count up the number of gradient evaluations, for example. And there's now um, a, a number of papers of that flavor some based on cubic regularization, some based on adapting accelerated gradient, some based on this idea of just taking gradient steps, but occasionally injecting noise to escape from saddle points. So there's been quite a lot of work on that. Let me tell you about um, a couple of the methods that we've developed. And as I said, this is consistent with our idea with, of starting with a practical method and then trying to enhance it in a way that gives it good complexity properties. So one of our attempts in this is a paper with uh, Clément and Mike O'Neill that appeared this year. And here we, it's a line search Newton CG procedure. So classical Newton CG is Newton's method, but you use conjugate gradient to solve the Newton equations, Hessian times D equals negative gradient. So we sort of build on that. And we take two kinds of steps. One kind is an approximate solution to the Newton equations, but slightly damped Newton equations. We add on two times epsilon H onto the diagonal. And the other kind of step we take is a negative curvature type step. And in both cases, we do a backtracking line search along each direction. The other thing we do is we, we have to make sure that the amount of time we spend in conjugate gradient in solving approximately these equations is not too great. Otherwise, that'll destroy our complexity. So we sort of add these features into the CG to make sure we don't take more than epsilon h to the minus one half iterations of CG. And then sort of right at the, typically only at the end of the process, we do a something called a minimum eigenvalue oracle where we call it a randomized Lanchos just to check, sort of as a final check that we haven't missed out on any negative curvature directions in the, in the Hessian. So these are the basic ingredients, these two kinds of steps, negative curvature direction, but most of them are these approximate damped Newton type steps. So this is the modified CG method, or at least an outline of it. it the details are a lot more messy and I'm sort of um, spending a little time describing this because this is used in many of our other methods as well. So basically the stuff in black is just total, totally standard conjugate gradient like you'd find in any textbook. But we modify it uh, by basically by introducing these fancy termination tests. And what these termination tests are looking for is uh, possible directions of negative curvature for a start. And secondly, they're sort of um, making sure that you don't spend too long taking too many iterations of CG. So at the start here, we define a lot of uh, constants and so on that I, I don't have time to you know, tell you the details of. Here we, we take the Hessian that's input and we add this damping term to the diagonal and we work with that. The reason for that is if we find that H bar, which is the modified Hessian, has a, uh, a direction along which a curvature is less than epsilon. That means that the original matrix H has a direction along which the curvature is less than minus epsilon because of the shift. And so we can use that, that vector as a direction of negative curvature. 
So in that CG, the termination test, you know, what's going on there is that first of all, we test if the residual drops below a certain threshold, then we figure, okay, we've found a good approximate solution to the damped Newton equation. So let's use that as a search direction. Then there are some checks to, to, uh, to, to see if you've stumbled across a negative curvature direction. So we do that. Then there's a sort of a fancy check, which is uh, if you know the convergence theory for conjugate gradient, you know that there's an upper bound on the rate of convergence of the residual. And so we check on how fast is the residual norm decreasing. And if, if it's not decreasing rapidly enough, we, that's sort of an indicator that the matrix H or H bar has a direction of negative curvature hiding in it. And so then, and we can show that you can find that from the iterates that you've generated so far. And that's a complicated argument. We built off an argument by uh, Carmen and Ducci um, that was based on an early one of Bubeck, uh, which uh, they were working with accelerated gradient rather than CG. But you can sort of, it's a very technical argument to show that you can reconstruct a negative curvature direction from previous iterates if you're not getting a, a decent convergence rate. So the end of all this is we're able to show that the complexity of this modified CG procedure or an upper bound on the number of iterations is order of the square root of epsilon. And an epsilon in this case is epsilon H, which is the damping that we apply. We usually set epsilon H to be the square root of epsilon G. So in terms of epsilon G, this complexity here is epsilon G to the minus one quarter. So that's the price we're paying for running uh, each iteration of CG, or at least an upper bound on the price. So the other ingredient, which I'll just say a little bit about, because it recurs through our algorithms as well, is this minimum eigenvalue oracle. And this is this thing where we hand it a matrix and we say, either give me back a direction where the curvature is less than or equal to minus epsilon over two and a vector that captures that curvature, or else give me a certificate that the smallest eigenvalue of that matrix is bigger than minus epsilon. And it turns out that randomized Lanchos can do that. There are these uh, beautiful papers from the early 90s that explain why that's true. Again, they have this complexity of epsilon to the minus one half. There's a possibility that you'll make a mistake because they work with a random starting vector. And if you get extremely unlucky in the choice of that vector, it won't pick up the negative eigenvalue quickly enough. But that, the, 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 the delta, the, the specified probability failure only enters logarithmically into the complexity, so you can make it extremely small. So it doesn't really play a, a role. So, so we use this a lot, sort of as a final check to make sure that the Hessian we're working with, um, we haven't missed any negative curvature directions. So this is our outline of our algorithm, and it's really pretty much as I've said, provided the gradient is above threshold, we just call CG, the modified CG, and it either gives us back a negative curvature step or an approximate damp Newton step. Either way, we use that as a search direction. If the gradient is small, seem to be at a stationary point or close to it, we call the MEO, minimum eigenvalue oracle, just to check that we haven't missed any negative curvature directions. And if the MEO certifies that the curvature is almost positive, we stop. Otherwise, we search along the negative curvature direction. So that's it, very simple um, uh, approach. And what we can show is that ultimately the complexity, the operation complexity, the number of Hessian vector products you need to find is bounded by uh, order epsilon g to the minus seven over four times this log of delta, where delta is a possibility that the randomized Lanchos will fail. Uh, actually, the, the amount of work, and that's to find a second order point. The amount of work to find a first order point is the same, but it doesn't have this probability of failure because if you don't care about um, possibly the MEO failing, uh, that's not a factor in finding an approximate first order point. So you would again get order of uh, epsilon g to the minus seven over four to find a first order point. One point is that this is independent of dimension. It, these complexities do, uh, the Lipschitz constant LG and LH do come in, but not the dimension n. So that's our line search method. Let me say a little bit about the, the trust region version of this. And this is work with Frank Curtis and Daniel Robinson and Clément. So again, we're working with a very practical method for constrained optimization, which is the trust region idea where at each step you um, form a quadratic model uh, around the current iterate XK uh, of the objective function and you minimize that model over some spherical truss region. And then you take a step depending on whether you got a reasonable decrease in F or not. 
Uh, and so this is uh, a method that's widely used. In fact, in large scale optimization, this approach of Steihaug has been very popular. It's described in this 1980 paper of Steihaug and he uh, made some very clever observations. Firstly, he said, okay, suppose you try to solve the trust region problem using conjugate gradient applied to that quadratic model. Start off with an initial guess of zero and then your approach is you just apply, you apply conjugate gradient steps. If any of them cross the trust region boundary, you just stop them at the boundary and use that point as your approximate solution. If you ever detect a negative curvature direction, use that as your uh, step. Um, uh, and if the trust region boundary never gets in the way, just keep iterating until you find the minimum of the, uh, of the model function, which of course takes at most n iterations. So, um, he was able to show that you can get nice properties from uh, from that method, and in fact, it's it's you know it's become popular in practice um, for various reasons that I mentioned here. Uh, it doesn't come with any complexity guarantees uh, because you know he didn't have complexity in mind there. He was more worried about practicality and about proving the standard convergence properties. And in fact, you know one of the problems with it is that the, the conjugate gradient can take too long. It can run for n iterations, and that tends to mess up complexity estimates. So we, we sort of asked, how can we modify this very nice approach, hopefully in minimal ways, so that we can equip it with this, the same sort of complexity results that we got for the line search method. And here are the changes. One is that we add this damping term onto the model function, just like we did in the line search uh, approach. Uh, we sort of need that to help us find negative curvature directions. Um, we, we also add an extra convergence test to the, uh, uh, we, we add an extra termination test to the CG procedure. Also, we have to keep checking when we're running CG, we have to keep checking that we don't leave the trust region. So that's an extra check that's needed inside CG. Otherwise, it's much the same as the CG that we use in the line search. And then we also have to have this final check of the minimum eigenvalue oracle. We have to, once the gradient is flat, we seem to be at a saddle point at least, we have to do this final check to make sure that we haven't missed um, uh, negative eigenvalues in the Hessian. Almost always, this is not. This is only needed on the very last iteration as a final check. If the Hessian has negative curvature in it, it's almost always found in the CG procedure for salt for minimizing this function. So this is just sort of a final, uh, final check on the on the on the process. And what sort of results do we get? Much the same as in line search, we end up with this order epsilon g to the minus seven over four uh, uh, iteration, uh, operation complexity and order epsilon g to the minus three over two. Those numbers are very familiar to people like you that work in this area. This epsilon g to the minus three over two iterations is what you get from the Nestor Polyak uh, cubic regularization procedure as well. So we decided to do some pretty extensive numerical testing with this, uh, modified Steihaug type method. So we took the Q to test set and took the larger problems from that set with dimensions between 100 and 1000. Uh, so that gave us a set of 109 problems. We programmed up a bunch of variants of this method. The one that I've described is this TR Newton CG explicit. Sorry for all the terminology there, but it's the purple line in this chart. Um, we used epsilon G to be 10 to the minus five epsilon H 10 to the minus five over two. Um, and, you know, the takeaway, this is a more a Dolan plot, which I don't have time to e explain, but generally higher lines on this plot are better. And ours is the purple line and you can, uh, you can't really see the purple line much in there, which is kind of a good sign because it's telling you that this modification that we made di didn't really affect the practical performance of this method very much. So this is, this is an iteration chart. We also uh, plotted the operations, so we kept track of the number of Hessian vector products. And there are four variants here. And again, ours is the, uh, the purple line. Um, the, the lower two lines here are the ones that added a little bit of damping into the trust region problem. And it turns out you do pay a little bit of a price for that. Um, that does make things a little bit slower than the ones that are undamped, uh, but not much. So this is not, not that great of a price to pay. Um, so, uh, so our conclusion from these experiments is that adding these extra features to guaranteed good complexity didn't sort of markedly affect the practical performance of this method. So we took that to be an encouraging uh, sign. Okay, so the third topic in unconstrained that I wanna mention is some recent work with Mike O'Neill, who just graduated. 
Um, and so here we sort of addressed unconstrained problems, but there were a very special class of unconstrained problems where the unknowns were matrices that are known to have low rank at the solution. And it turns out that in matrix optimization problems in machine learning, there are a lot of problems like this, where your unknown is a matrix of high dimension, M and N large, but at the solution, the rank is typically small. So uh, I mentioned a couple here, matrix completion, matrix sensing, and so on. So one way to reformulate them that's become more popular the last few years is to actually explicitly replace the unknown X, the big matrix X, with an outer product of two long skinny matrices U and V. And so you can essentially reformulate this problem as the problem of minimizing a function big F over U and V. So I've just aggregated U and V into this matrix W to make a really big long skinny matrix and minimize f of w instead. Now the problem with that of course is it's non-convex and so people have always been worried isn't this you know possibly going to go to a saddle point or a local minimum how do we know this is really going to find the, pro the the solution of the original problem. But it turns out that in many many settings this this is a very special non-convex problem it has a so-called robust strict saddle property. So there's a paper by our colleagues at uh, Colorado uh, School of Mines uh, where they showed that um, uh, very often these problems have this nice property that any unknown W falls into one of three classes, at least one of three classes. Either it's got a big gradient, the gradient of G. G, by the way, is you get by taking F and adding on an extra regularization term. The purpose of this term is to fix the scaling in U and V. You can sort of see here that there's a scale ambiguity in the product of U times V transpose. If you multiply U by two, divide v, v by two, the product UV transpose is unaffected. But by adding on this term, you sort of make sure that that ambiguity goes away. So it sort of uh, doesn't really play that big a role in the algorithm. Uh, so anyway, uh, so the strict saddle property is that either the gradient is big or the Hessian has a significant direction of negative curvature or you're close to a local minimizer. So one of those three things, at least one of the three things happens for every W. Also, if you're close to a local minimizer, the so-called regular, regularity condition holds, which I'm, I don't really have time to explain. It depends on uh, uh, two constants, alpha and beta. So there has been a lot of work on problems like this over the last, I don't know, six or seven years. And one way that people have approached these problems is to find a good initial point using, for example, by doing a big uh, SVD on the data and then just running gradient descent on that point. So that's one way people have attached, attacked this problem. Another way people have attacked this is to just uh, naively run a gradient method and have some way of escaping the saddle points. And that's not a bad approach, but some methods sort of, they need you to know these parameters in advance. They need to know what this minus gamma is in order to work. And that's not very satisfactory because in practice that minus gamma depends on the rth singular value of the solution. And that's not something that you typically know. So we asked the question, can we come up with, um, with algorithms that don't need this expensive initialization and that don't require prior knowledge of these, uh, of these uh, uh, parameters that show up in this, uh, uh, in this um, strict saddle uh, property condition that in other words, find those things uh, adaptively. And so we did come up with a method. Uh, it maintains explicitly an estimate of the strict saddle parameter gamma as gamma K. It also estimates these other parameters alpha and beta based on gamma. Um, it uses those estimates to check these conditions two and three to, to sort of check to see if the, uh, uh, the minimum eigenvalue is below a threshold or the, the gradient norm is above a threshold and then takes appropriate knowledge. Um, if neither of those two conditions are satisfied, it says, well, maybe I'm in the solution of a local minimizer, so I can just run gradient descent and find that local minimizer quickly. Um, and so it does that. Now, of course, it might make a mistake. It could be that your estimates of these parameters are not accurate enough and that you enter the local phase prematurely. And in that case, it's smart enough to exit the local phase without wasting too much effort. So the, the basic idea looks like this, um, you know, it sort of goes along the lines that I've just described in the hand wavy way. It checks the gradient size. If the gradient's bigger than gamma to the three over two, it just takes a negative gradient step. Uh, otherwise it looks at the Hessian and asks is the, uh, if the eigenvalue of the, the Hessian 
if the smallest eigenvalue of a Hessian is bigger than minus gamma, then you go into this local phase, you figure you're in the, the region of the local minimum. If that doesn't work, you've come out of the local phase and you halve your value of gamma. You figure it was too big and then you uh, continue to go on. If the, low, if the MEO found a negative curvature direction, you use that as the search direction. So it does all of those things. Now you might say, well, you've been telling me that the MEO takes order of epsilon to the minus one half complexity. So isn't that just one call to MEO, isn't that gonna destroy your hope of finding a complexity that's only logarithmic in epsilon? Well, the answer is no. And the reason is that when we call MEO, we're only trying to find a, uh, an eigenvalue that's accurate to within gamma K or gamma K over two. And that gamma K ultimately is gonna be independent of epsilon. So the amount of work you spend in MEO, it's actually bounded by a constant that's independent of epsilon. So that actually doesn't mess up your analysis after all, just as well. So this is the basic method. It is a pretty complicated, intricate method when you include other uh, pieces in it as well, but that's the basic idea, just to try, try to detect which of the regions you're in and take a, a step accordingly. And we end up being able to show that the number of iterations and the number of operations that you uh, take is in fact logarithmic in epsilon. And that's, a, of course, a huge improvement over what we get uh, from the methods that I told you earlier, which are, which are polynomial in epsilon G inverse and epsilon H inverse. And they also depend on the, on the size of the rth singular value. That is, you're dealing with rank, a rank R solution and the size of that smallest, smallest non-zero eigenvalue does come into the complexity as well. Okay, so uh, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. So I'm very aware that uh, I'm not, not allowed to go for the more than 45 or 50 minutes. So let me talk a little bit about non-negativity constraint problems. So we want to extend these ideas to problems where um, there are, uh, the X variable is also constrained to be non-negative. All the components need to be non-negative. So you'll know uh, well that the first order conditions for X to be a minimizer of uh, or a solution of this problem are that X and the gradient of F both are non-negative vectors and that they're complementary to each other. So you can partition the components into three sets, the components of X into three sets. There's the ones where the XI is zero and the gradient is strictly positive. So that's an active component. There are ones where the, the XI is strictly positive. That's an inactive component. And there are ones where both the gradient and XI are zero. And they're the troublesome ones. They're the degenerate ones. And so the strongest form of second order necessary conditions are that you require the Hessian of F to be, uh, to have positive curvature along a, uh, for all V in a direction set that's not necessarily a subspace, it's a cone. And that's what makes it hard to check in general. If there are any indices in this degenerate set, this is a cone rather than a subspace. And it can actually be in the worst case, uh, it can be uh, uh, NP hard to check second order conditions. So what we do here and what many other people before us have done is to use a weaker form of second order necessary conditions, which is simply to require that the two-sided projection onto the, of the Hessian onto the space of inactive components is semi-definite. So that's what I'm gonna mean by second order components here. So I'll say a little bit about a log barrier method that uh, uh, was based on one by uh, uh, Yi and Hazer and, and Zhang, I think, uh, from 2018. Um, we're gonna work with a slightly different set of uh, uh, optimality, approximate optimality conditions from them. We're gonna define this vector X bar, which is the minimum of X and one, component-wise minimum of X and one. And we're gonna declare a point to be approximate first order accurate if the gradient uh, has all its components bigger than minus epsilon. And then this thing here captures the complementarity condition. It says that the, the product uh, of X bar with the gradient of F, uh, all its components have to be less than epsilon. And for the second order condition, we're gonna require that this two-sided scaling of the Hessian um, have all its eigenvalues bigger than minus square root of epsilon. So basically what we do, it's very easy to describe. We just write down the log barrier function corresponding to that constrained problem. We fix the value of mu. In fact, we set it to be just one half of epsilon where epsilon is the, uh, is the accuracy that we're looking for. 
And we essentially what we do is apply our Newton CG method, the line search Newton CG method for unconstrained minimization that I told you about earlier. We apply it to this barrier function. We make some modifications. Firstly, of course, we want to keep all the iterates positive. So we allow it to take steps almost all the way to the boundary, but not quite. We need to stay positive. And we have to apply a couple of other modifications to make sure that um, it doesn't you know, generate negative iterates and so on. One of the significant modifications that we apply is that we apply the, the CG process to a scaled version of, of the uh, log barrier function. So we scale it by, we work in this transform space where we use this, this uh, matrix X bar, which as I'll remind you is the maximum of, the component wise maximum, maximum of X and one. And so that makes sure by doing the scaling, we make sure that this matrix H that we're applying CG to, its eigenvalues don't blow up, its condition number doesn't blow up, and we can still get reasonable performance of the uh, modified CG procedure. We're still able to guarantee that it terminates in order of epsilon to the minus one quarter iterations. So apart from that, everything here is almost uh, like what you um, saw in the, um, in the unconstrained case. And uh, in fact, what we end up with is iteration complexities that look a lot like, and operation complexities that look a lot like the unconstrained case. Order epsilon to minus 704, for example, in the operation complexity. We do unfortunately have this term, uh, this order n creeping in, and this seems to be an unavoidable, unavoidable consequence of using log barrier. Um, if, we, if we could assume a priori that the iterates were all bounded, this order n term wouldn't appear. But in practice, we can't necessarily assume that. The iterates might run off, uh, and they might run off because those log terms keep getting more and more negative, although you know, very slowly. Uh, and so unfortunately, these extra terms creep in here. So, uh, okay, so that's one sort of little you know, drawback of this approach. So, uh, so uh, okay, well, I've got one more uh, method to tell you about in the in the, uh, in the bound constraint case, and that's its projected Newton CG procedure. So this again is motivated by a practical uh, method. And that is, uh, it's a method that uh, I worked with more than 30 years ago when I was solving linear programs with augmented Lagrangian. I came up with a method for convex QP that did this. And then George Moray and uh, Chi Jin Len uh, did this for general non-convex problems in um, in 1999. But the basic approach is as follows. It says, uh, first of all, you divide the components of X into active and free components. The active ones are the ones that are near their bound and the free components are everything else basically. And uh, on most steps, you take sort of uh, conjugate gradient Newton steps in the reduced space corresponding to the free variables. Um, if you seem to have reached a minimum in that space, you might instead take a gradient uh, descent step with respect to all the variables. And so that's essentially what we do. We sort of use the same strategy as in that method, but again, we have to retool things and do things very carefully uh, to make sure that we can get complexity. So this is current joint work with, uh, with UAG. So we look to satisfy first order conditions of this kind. For the free variables, we need the gradients to be bigger than minus epsilon. For the active variables, the ones near their bound, uh, unfortunately, for technical reasons, we can't guarantee that the gradient's going to be bigger than minus epsilon. We, all we can guarantee is it's minus epsilon to the three quarters. So we'd like to change that three quarters to a one. So that's something that we're still working on. But apart from that, these conditions are similar to the ones that I had in that log barrier thing that I mentioned earlier. So we take three kinds of steps. First of all, we look at the free variables. And if we don't seem to have hit a minimum in the free variables yet, we apply the familiar damped Newton nonlinear CG process to that. If we do seem to have hit a minimum in the free variables, the gradient seems to be flat, we, we may take a step in the negative, a projected gradient step, provided that um, these uh, optimality conditions here are violated. Uh, we'll take a projected gradient step. Otherwise, we, event we do this um, final check to make sure we're not missing out on uh, negative curvature directions in the two-sided projected Hessian. So we do that as well. So the three kinds of steps. Along all of those steps, we project back onto the feasible set. We do a backtracking line search and so on. We end up getting the same sort of um, uh, iteration and operation complexity as you get, uh, as I've shown earlier for the unconstrained case. 
Uh, and so, uh, but you know, there's this little caveat that we have this slightly weaker optimality condition here that we're working on getting rid of. But at least this is, you know, tied, unlike the log barrier method, which is not particularly practical, this is a practical method that people really, I think, do, you know, it is a plausible method for solving bad constraint problems. Right, in the few minutes I've have, I have left, I'll just say a little bit about our work on, um, uh, on non-convex, uh, uh, non-convexly constrained uh, non-convex optimization. So here I'm dealing with minimizing F subject to this vector of uh, a nonlinear smooth vector of constraints, C of X equals zero. Um, and here it's pretty easy to define what first and second order conditions are. First order conditions are just that the gradient of Lagrangian should be less than some threshold epsilon. This is an approximate first order condition. And also the, the uh, norm of the constraint vector should be less than epsilon as well. And secondly, the approximate second order condition just says that the curvature of the Lagrangian in the, neg in the null space of the constraint gradients, that should be also positive definite, or at least not too negative, the curvature bigger than minus epsilon. So we're gonna be targeting points that satisfy both of these conditions. So the, the method that we were working with here, again, is a method that I think people do use to solve these problems. The matter of Lagrangian, it turns out it is used a lot in machine learning these days. And of course, uh, Congul and Twant worked on this a lot 30 years ago and have a, uh, a very effective package that's based on augmented Lagrangian. This is proximal augmented Lagrangian. So it works with the augmented Lagrangian, but it adds on this prox term at every iteration. Uh, and once again, we, we sort of like to build on earlier results that we were using. So our approach here is to use this proximal augmented Lagrangian framework, but to solve this subproblem, which may still be non-convex, using our techniques for um, uh, unconstrained optimization that I talked about in the first part of the talk. So this again is work with, uh, with UA. So here we uh, evaluate uh, complexity in three ways. We look at the outer iteration complexity, we look at the total iteration complexity, that is we add up how many iterations of uh, unconstrained uh, Newton CG did we require in the inner loop summed up over all the outer loops. So we look at that as well. And finally, we look at the operation complexity, which is where we try to bound the number of gradients and Hessian vector products. Um, and importantly, we don't assume that the beta is large enough to swamp out the non-convexity. We do allow there to be uh, non-convex subproblems here. So here are the results we get for outer iterations. First of all, uh, it, it all depends on how you choose the beta and the row. The beta is the prox parameter, the row is the penalty parameter that you apply to the quadratic or the square of the gradient violations. Um, so if I pick some parameter eta between zero and two, and I set the prox parameter to be epsilon to the eta, so that's generally small, I set the penalty parameter to be epsilon to the minus eta, that's generally large. Um, we end up showing that the number of added iterations that you take is order uh, epsilon to the eta minus two. So the consequence of that is if eta equals two, you're only taking order one out of iterations, right? So this means you're making a very small choice of beta, uh, order one choice of rho, and you're only taking epsilon to the minus one out of iterations. So that's plausible, but the problem there is that the inner iterations are extremely ill-conditioned um, because you're, you're gonna be choosing a very large choice of rho. And so um, this, uh, the eigenvalues of this augmented Lagrangian are gonna be all over the place of the Hessian of the augmented Lagrangian. So the inner iterations are gonna be very expensive. Whereas if eta equals zero, these are both order one, the beta and the rho, and, uh, but now the, uh, and so you're going to take epsilon to the minus two outer iterations, but now the inner iterations might be uh, more well conditioned and therefore, um, uh, therefore slower. So that's what you need to get a, a, an epsilon one order stationary point. To get the epsilon two order stationary point, essentially all you need to do is to make sure that all the subproblem solutions have Hessians that are almost positive semi definite. So the complexities are essentially the same. So for total iteration complexities, oh, I know I've got to come to the end here. For total iteration complexities, uh, we get estimates like this, uh, a little bit complicated, so I won't go into it. Operation complexities like this. So we get powers of epsilon that are starting to get pretty big here. By the way, the powers, the, the case of linear constraints is much better um, because uh, you do pay a high price for having nonlinear constraints. It, 
introduces all kinds of extra opportunities for ill conditioning and the sub problems. So I want to point out, and I won't have time to discuss this, but many other people have worked on recently on uh, constrained non-convex optimization using a bunch of different kinds of algorithms. A lot of limited settings, like they only consider limited uh, linear constraints or approximate first order conditions, or they only look at iteration or evaluation complexities. I've sort of listed here a lot of um, approaches people have been taking just in the last five years. The oldest paper here is this one of Carter School and Twant from 2011. So this is a very active area. People are trying a lot of different approaches. I would say that and in some cases, the complexities are better than the ones I've described here. I would say the thing about our approach is that it is tackling an algorithm that that is like uh, one that people use in practice. And some of the algorithms here are practical. Others are algorithms that are sort of more uh, theoretical in nature, but this is a very active area of research. So let me conclude by thanking the organizers and thanking you for your attention very much. Um, just to say that there are still a lot of open questions here, particularly uh, in the uh, non-linear non constraint case, I would say. And finally, uh, just to say that I think this exercise of taking uh, you know, good, well-performing methods and just trying to tweak them a little bit so that they have good theoretical complexity properties as well. I found it to be a very interesting exercise. So thank you very much, uh, Radu. Thank you, Steve. Great talk. Thank you very much. So uh, it's time for questions. So then, yeah, let me ask the first question. So you, at some point, you, you had this, these three situations where, uh, yeah, I think the, the variable was uh, denoted by W star. W star was either a local minimum or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or yeah, that was, was back far, here from, the, far uh, from being, yeah, okay. So then there was, there was this inequality, okay. And, and the question is, so this, this inequality is a kind of strong monotonicity. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So at which point uh, is this used? It, is, is the it, it, turns out, it turns out that many matrix optimization problems have this property naturally, many mm -hmm. low rank problems. So th this, this cuts in, this is a thing that gives you nice local uh, linear convergence behavior if you're in the mm -hmm. neighborhood of W star. And so that's part of the algorithm here. When you go into the so-called local phase in the algorithm, you're sort of guessing that you're within a neighborhood where this regularity property holes. Okay, yeah. And then you get this local rapid convergence that, al yeah. that allows you to get this logarithmic dependence on the epsilon. Okay. And that, that's the interesting thing that the, the, you know, I've, I've simplified the discussion here of what it means to have the robust strict cell property. The full description is in this paper here. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry, I've jumped to a different place. Um, by the way, the slides have all my references at the end here. So look them up okay. if you if you yep. want to. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing here is that any given W is in one of these three situations, local minimum, big gradient or big negative curvature. And in all three situations, you can take a reasonable step that yeah. reduces the function by a significant amount. Yeah, it is very, very nice property, very nice construction. And this function G is fulfilling this, this uh, yeah, inequality. Right, it okay. fulfills these properties, yeah. Cool. So we have a question by Misha Kochvara. So uh, please hi, unmute. Steve. Yeah. Hi, Misha. The question is when you spoke about the complexity of the Steyhoek method. Yeah. You said that CG needs at most n iterations. So does it mean you, you work just with exact arithmetics? Right. Then so uh, the complexity a bit. Yeah. So that that is that uh, if you just run it naively and iterate all the way to solution, the, the CG could run for n iterations. Now, of course, you could have some early termination property on the CG where you could stop early than that. But the problem with standard early termination properties is they can't necessarily guarantee that you're only taking order epsilon to the minus one quarter iterations inside CG. So we have to sort of have this pretty elaborate uh, set of uh, termination checks inside CG to make sure that we're not doing too much work. Uh, the question is that if you have ill-conditioned problems, that it can be actually many more than n steps to, uh, due to round of errors. You mean in practice? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, uh, so I'm talking here about exact arithmetic. And th this is something that we actually encountered in doing the numerical tests, you know, and 
those of you that do a lot of numerics, um, this won't be at all a surprise to you, but when you actually run CG in practice, Randolph error does play an important role. And we observe this in these experiments that, uh, that uh, every so often we sort of had to recalibrate or restart CG. Uh, otherwise it would, uh, it would sometimes run for longer. But all of these results here are just purely theoretical. So I'm assuming that you're doing exact arithmetic inside CG. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Michel. So Nicola Buma, please unmute your microphone and ask the question. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yeah, Nicholas. Hello, Steve. Uh, thanks a lot for your very nice talk. So I had a question about, so toward the end, you were talking about the constraint case, mm -hmm. specifically about uh, augmented Lagrangian methods. Right. I was wondering um, how much do you need to, re you know, to require about the sub-problem solver? So I, I think I saw something about the approximate satisfaction of the constraints. Yeah. Uh, but it went a bit fast toward the end for me. So I was Yeah, wondering... yeah, yeah. Sorry, I had to rush over this no, part. I, I, I realize that. No, no worries at all. No, but yeah, I was but, wondering but, if but you essentially have... we, we need the subproblem to satisfy approximate optimality conditions. And the precise conditions look like this. We need the gradient of the of the subproblem thing to be the less than uh, minimum of one over k and one half epsilon. So basically it's epsilon accurate, but we also need it decreasing to zero. Mm -hmm. And we need the Hessian of the subproblem to be bigger than, to have all the second waves bigger than minus one half epsilon. So it's the same sort of conditions that we had in the unconstrained case, except for this one over K feature. We do need it to decrease to zero. Ah, but so there's no explicit condition that the, um, that the norm of the, of C at XK should be, should be small. No, that's sort of implicit in this condition here. Okay. Because if you take the gradient of the augmented Lagrangian, you get rho times C. And uh, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of disguised in that. I see. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So we have another question. Bruno Lorenzo, would you like to ask a question? Your question? Ah, uh, first, thank you for the very interesting presentation. I'm just curious about uh, the slightly more practical part regarding the constraint, uh, the algorithms for the constraint case. It's just yeah. that I noticed that there were no uh, numerical results, but you mentioned that most of these algorithms are either practical or likely to be uh, practical, right? So I just wanted to hear a bit more about. Well, it's this is a very long discussion, and we have a discussion in our paper where we, uh, you know, try to uh, review a little bit about what's been happening in this space. Um, some of these methods here, and there's really quite a variety of different methods that people have looked at recently. Um, some of them are plausible as practical methods. Others uh, uh, have very nice properties. For example, this two-phase. Uh, approach of that uh, the Carter School and Twan and Bergen and Martinez and others have been working on. It has very nice complexity properties, but it's not especially uh, fast. It could maybe in future inspire some fast methods, but by, as, by itself, it's not necessarily, I would say it's probably not competitive with the best methods for, uh, I mean, Nick Gould can correct me if I'm wrong, but probably not competitive with the best methods for nonlinear programming that are out there. But other methods here that they are based on um, uh, methods of practical type. So there has been work by these authors on augmented Lagrangian methods, for example. In so, sometimes in special cases, for example, this paper is just, they just get second order conditions in the linearly constrained case. So some of these have sort of limited settings, but I, I don't want to go into giving you a review of all of this, first of all, because it's not particularly fresh in my mind, but secondly, the, the, the picture is quite complicated. Um, and uh, hopefully this is one of the things that shakes out better in the, in the next few years. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. So we have another question by Isvar Mani Adhikari. So I can also ask the question. So the question is if uh, yeah, everything is uh, only about time complexity or is there any connection to space complexity? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, no, we didn't explicitly look at space complexity, but uh, it, almost all of these methods, the, uh, the Newton CG thing plays a role and that doesn't have big storage requirements. You only need to keep track of a few vectors there. Um, the exception is that if you go back to our 
uh, our line search Newton uh, unconstrained, uh, Newton CG unconstrained method, um, the, the conjugate gradient method that we use there, if it detects negative curvature in a certain way, it, it, it may need to go back and look at all the previous iterates in order to construct a negative curvature direction. So you may need to store all of the previous iterates. And so there might be a significant uh, buildup of space complexity there. But uh, in fact, that's not really necessary because if necessary, it can just regenerate all those iterates, just run the whole thing again. And uh, so you can get rid of that space complexity. So my impression is that this com the space complexity is really only order, you know, N or a small multiple of N um, because we're okay. just storing a few vectors and gradients and conjugate gradient, you know, work yeah. vectors. Okay, thank you. Negin Bagarpur. Would you like to ask a question? Um, hello. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your nice talk. Uh, I just want to see, uh, is there any kind of um, approximation function like a SQP strategy in case of low rank optimization? Uh, so are you talking about the matrix optimization stuff? Yeah. And uh, so what's your question again? Uh, I want to see if uh, there is a kind of um, quadratic approximation um, uh, using trace function or something. Uh -huh. um, so instead of instead of just working with gradients, you you think uh, that we could work with a Hessian of G as well? I see. Uh, well, we don't uh, do that explicitly. We don't try to take an approximate Newton step in this particular algorithm mm -hmm. because the gradient step is kind of good enough to get... Um, uh, to get the sort of uh, complexity results we're looking for. Um, it, it's not out of the question that you could use an approximation to the Hessian of G and do some sort of a scale gradient step or approximate Newton step. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, we didn't think about that. But you might be right. That, that, that could be something that, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's sort of from a complexity point of view, it's pretty hard to beat um, this logarithmic dependence of an epsilon. So that's why we didn't look too much beyond this. I see, I see. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So I have a last question, Steve. Sure. So in the, in the, in the proximal method, in the augmented Lagrangian method, you are, yeah, you showed at the end. So uh, what is the stoppy criterion for the inner loop? Uh, yeah, so that's here. Um, that's this, uh, I showed them on this slide, but I get, didn't get a chance okay. to talk about them. Yeah. So basically you need the gradient you know, that's an unconstrained problem you're solving in the inner loop. So you want the gradient to have norm less than one over K, a minimum of one over K and one half epsilon, where K is the iteration number. So we need to drive it to zero slowly. Okay. And you need the Hessian to basically be nearly positive definite. So that's what we need if we're looking for second order complexities. Mm -hmm. And you are counting also these iterations, yeah? Yes, absolutely. So when yeah. the total iteration complexity here is we're counting up all the Newton CG iterations at the inner loop. And okay. the operation complexity is we're counting up all the Hessian vector products in the entire algorithm. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Manuel. I see Manuel Bonze. Thank you. Thanks, Hi, Steve, Amy. For, for your presentation. As always, a big pleasure. Thank um, you. Um, probably I'm repeating one of the questions, but I did not get all the answers. So in case of a large gradient, you, you talked about backtracking. Are yeah. you, and in your estimates, are you using exact line search there or any, any approximate line uh, search? No, it's all backtracking. All of these, pretty much all of these methods we're using uh, backtracking. So um, there's a bit of a trick in all of them in deciding how to choose the initial choice of alpha. Yes. In backtracking. Um, sometimes it's just one, like in Newton's method, uh, and we just backtrack by a constant amount every time. But, uh, but we always have a criterion like this. We have some sort of sufficient decrease criterion. And it actually differs between algorithms and between step types. For example, that uh, Newton CG projected gradient that I talked about, we've got three different sufficient decrease conditions depending on the three types of steps. Um, but no, it's never an exact line search. It's always some backtracking line search. And we can always show that the number of backtracks that you need to do 
is uh, logarithmic in, um, it only adds a logarithmic factor okay. to the complexity. Uh, yeah, thank you. We, this, we can always show that there's some. explains why we don't have to focus on the actual selection of this. Thank you. That's right. That's right. We, we can almost always show that once the alpha drops below some order epsilon quantity, that this sufficient decrease condition is, is guaranteed to be satisfied. So that implies that the number of backtracks you need to do is order log epsilon. Yeah. So okay. it, it doesn't add appreciably to the complexity. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Manuel. So, Steve, it's time to stop. Thank okay. you very much for the nice talk. For, Thank you. Yeah, for answering Thank uh, you for the, the many uh, questions you, you had for a nice discussion. So, it was a pleasure. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. And thanks to the other organizers as well. Okay. I, I just want to announce that we'll post a video and the slides on, the, on our website. And that the next speaker will be Ari Stanilidis from Chile. So thank you again, Steve. It was great. It was a nice talk. We had a nice discussion. Have a nice week. And uh...